Cool. Okay. Yat e she e brenna ti wez in ishe. Tudachit ni nishle. Tachit ni dasha che. Unagri wang shik yaki kerich. Standing rak su dashanella. I got a god ne ada ho chankastan nishle. Hello everyone, my name is Brenna Tubers and I am very excited to be up here talking to you about a community-based youth program that I originally developed for the Ho-Chunk Nation Museum's grand opening and the process I went through to get there. Hopefully this helps you to understand how important institutions like SAR can be to tribal communities and how they can help address traumas our youth face today. We all know that powerful imagery matters. It delegitimizes tribal nations through corporations, the NFL, Hollywood, museums. What the larger community sees influences how they think and act, whether they're aware of it or not. I grew up watching Disney's Pocahontas. My sisters and I, we used to go around the house singing that song from it, Savages. In hindsight, it sounds funny, uh, a bunch of little native girls singing their favorite song, not the one about how to paint with the colors of the wind or whatever. No, we sang the song that villainized and vilified who we were as a people. I remember my mom used to say that on the one hand, she never had any mainstream media that had a native woman as the protagonist with her own meaningful narrative arc. But on the other hand, she knew the power this movie had, how it would rewrite the history of a young woman stolen from her homeland, taken to a foreign place for England to gawk at, where she would die of a disease that she had no immunity against. I grew up with this sort of dichotomy in me. Kids asked if I lived in a teepee, but I only knew the lodge and the hogan. Teachers all but forced me to get up and teach whole lessons on boarding schools in high school while my mom was writing her dissertation on the loop boarding school where her parents, where her grandparents went. For me, this was a clash of how the larger non-native population viewed me and all of the intergenerational trauma I had to deal with. But my childhood was also full of more than this survival of genocide. It was full of powwows run by high school kids, indigenous filmmakers that started in the neighborhoods that I grew up in, and many, many, many visits to tribal museums courtesy of my mom. All of these opportunities to find instances of my identity in this world we exist in now, it built a foundation for me. I witnessed the evolution of our culture, that resilience that meant we could be here now despite the past 400 years. I'll be using the word tradition a lot in this presentation. That word as it is understood in the English language, it means something different to me when applied to an indigenous concept. It does not mean old fashioned and artifact from a time long past. Instead, I think of tradition, my tradition, as a concept of adaptation. Sometimes we forget just how quickly our people adapted to their current situations. At the beginning of the colonization of this land, new textiles and languages and ideas were introduced at a rapid rate. We, as a people, learned to integrate this almost instantaneously keeping pace with technological advancements beyond our imaginations. Silk became ribbon work, be glass became beaded everything. We structured our indigenous language into words that could be read in newspapers. And you can see that happening again today with every generation that flourishes. Uh, my sophomore year of college, I attended my first nonprofit event hosted by my community for my community. This group of young Diné activists started out in 2015 speaking out against the Pinyon pipeline. Over time, they evolved into a movement that sought to restore Hojo and Ke. In Flagstaff, Arizona, they held an event the day before their walk from, do, from our sacred mountain to the next, 
there were so many amazing things happening at the time, but what really struck me was how fully they merged their activism through raising public awareness, through art. They engaged the community through live music, through the blending of powwow and modern dance, through a collaborative mural right outside of their building. Watching that piece of art come to life was mind-blowing. Um, from this experience, I retained two things. The first was their ability to reach a wider audience through social media, and the second was how they used that platform to translate their dedication to our people into action. What I mean by that is they had somehow managed to connect the past, the broken treaties and forced removal of our people to the present, informing the community about these current events and onto the future by reaching younger generations like me through avenues we are familiar with. In their endeavors, they prioritize indigenous knowledge. Their content focused on the relationship of human beings to both one another and to their ecosystem. Keep that in mind, because it'll come into play later. Um, fast forward a few years, and I've graduated college with a bachelor's in art history and gained years of policy work in development, courtesy of Whitman College. I had been away from family and tribal communities for almost a decade at that point, fighting for the right to be recognized and acknowledged in places that did not want to hear what I had to say. It was pretty difficult. Um, but changing a mascot and founding a club for indigenous people and shining light on struggles us native people still face today, it prepared me for the next thing. I knew what was out there. I knew what we were up against. And I was ready to go home to pass on what I had, what I had learned. That following summer, I got my internship with one of my tribes, the Ho-Chunk Nation. I started work with Josie Lee, the current head of what will soon be the first Ho-Chunk Nation Museum and Cultural Center. Being a part of the process to build that museum from the ground up was a dream come true. I planned future fundraisers and I tried my hand at graphic design for the whole heritage preservation department and learned the ups and downs of working in tribal government. During my time with my tribe, I also got the immense privilege of helping to plan and implement the first ever Ho-Chunk Nation Summer Culture Camp. This culture camp came on the heels of the first ever Ho-Chunk Winter Culture Camp, which was a huge success. The general setup of these seasonal camps goes like this. They have a theme within the broader context of cultural revitalization And we collaborate with artists who still practice traditional uh, poaching basket making, weaving belts, or fashioning mats from grass. The day of, we have all of these activities going, and our attendees with the option to choose whichever activity they want to participate in or learn about. Because our communities are spread out a little wide, we try to choose different locations for each camp. The winter camp was for telling stories and practicing our arts, these activities that we performed during shorter days and harsher weather. For the summer camp, it was decided we would go with health and wellness. We encouraged the youth group in the Mostyn community to assist in building a lodge which combined physical labor with passing on knowledge to the younger generation. We took nature walks through the land to introduce plants and medicines to people, and we offered healthy and traditional food to eat throughout the day as well. In each and every act, from what we serve for lunch to how we set up camp, we made sure to indigenize our methods. Again, I saw this connection between my people to our land, between the past, present, and future. Again, we see the use of social media platforms to reach a wider audience focusing on the youth. But this time, I'm on the other side of that screen trying my hand at graphic design and marketing. I'm the one reaching out to my younger brothers and sisters in the hopes of instilling in them the same confidence and pride that I have for my identity. A few months ago, I attended my first Association of Tribal, Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museum conference at Damaya. There were so many instances of tribal members reaching out to their communities through institutions like a museum. I saw a comic book artist develop lessons that incorporated 
popular culture with art, where you were encouraged to express yourself through visual culture. We had the duration of this talk to design our own uh, superhero, and I went with a Ho Chunk themed one, um, dressed in clothing culturally specific to one of my communities. This type of activity for these kids who never got to see themselves on the big screen outside of the stoic warrior archetype or the Indian princess, they got to see who, they got to create who they wanted to see, who really represented them. I got to experience this type of collaboration between nations of addressing similar problems we all see in our communities. No one held anything back. We all shared our ideas and an ad adaption of our traditional communal trading system of not only goods, but knowledge. It was here that I was finally able to see that what I had been observing as a high school kid, then as a college student, and now as a recent graduate was right. These things I had been participating in, ideas I had been coming up with, I was right. I got to see my role models like Jacqueline Russell and Winona LaDuke get up on that stage in front of people and talk about issues that were both current and important to me. Their words, and their work, it has always inspired me throughout all of these stages in my professional and personal life. In the IARC speaker series, even more amazing Native women again got up to speak about how important images are and how important it is for these images to be accurate. Earlier, I talked about a dichotomy inside of me, about the gap between how people perceive me and how I perceive myself. Perceive myself. What I didn't mention was how the stress of living with one foot in two vastly different worlds can warp the mind. You see one image on the screen and you've seen a million. It never gets any easier. You just get more used to it. And the more familiar you become with these false images, the more familiar you become with the false identity that others force on you. As a young person, I experienced this genocide of who we are through visual culture. Not only did I doubt myself, but I began to doubt and mistrust my own identity, my elders' wisdom, my instincts, my own creativity and inspiration. The Ho-Chunk have a sort of saying that there are three different types of elders. The first is someone who just gets older. They have gray hair, but none of the attributes of the second someone who spent their life gathering knowledge available to them. But even this elder isn't open enough to accept the last missing trait that every Ho-Chunk person aspires to. The wisdom that comes with the knowledge. The wisdom that says, no matter how old you get, no matter how much you think you know, we are all students. And to be a lifelong student is to understand that when you, that while younger people can learn a lot from their elders, so too can their elders learn a lot from them. What I have learned is that what we see in our daily lives impacts how people view us, but more importantly, how we view ourselves. While working with the Ho Chunk Nation, I started to plan an opening event. I wanted to get artists involved, elders, teachers, but most importantly, I wanted to get the youth involved. Though many of the programs we did with the youth centered around connecting them to their culture, it didn't, I didn't see as many giving our children a voice, a chance to speak up about what they thought and to be taken seriously. My plan was to host workshops throughout the school year with children from all of our communities, from the Twin Cities to the Mission in Black River Falls. I wanted these kids to learn how to use what they had to start creating their own stories. The ideal was for them to explore what they know about their culture, including family, language, art, and the land, whilst gaining all the skills that go along with filmmaking. We were going to showcase these films as the main event, free for tribal members and available to everyone else throughout the weekend. Then, not only would the kids get to see their work on the big screen, but we would also include their films as part of the permanent exhibition in our museum because whether or not museums admit to their past mistakes, own up to them, and try to right them, the culture of museums in our country is that they have an authoritative voice that people listen to. And these kids, they'd get to be a part of that. 
Utilizing smartphones as an avenue to connect to cultures then becomes another program and a line of successful and innovative ways to revitalize our cultures. We have all of these blendings of technologies and tradition in video games like Never Alone that tells a story millennia old about a figure in Inupiat oral tradition with their indigenous language, the only language spoken throughout the whole game. Tribes are developing and offering free language apps from the iTunes and Google App Store. And all of these films coming out, so many amazing concepts that you can only get from cultures whose whole histories and family stories descended from our tradition of oral stories. We are natural storytellers, and the way we translate that through visual audio technologies, it's truly groundbreaking. When you think of editing a film, I think of carving. Sound becomes our songs, lighting becomes our understanding of colors, and the scripts are now reaching heights that the English language, with all of its faults and rule breaks, can only dream of. While I was at the IARC, I got the chance to enact everything that I had been learning up to this point. We're a part of the youth development program at the Santa Fe Youth Detention Center, and our programs consist of IARC representatives working in collaboration with artists to bring art education to these kids. I had the pleasure of working with an amazing artist, Eliza Naranjo Morse, on talking to these kids and expressing themselves through art. This is a picture that I drew, although I was mostly walking around and interacting with the kids. I remember one of them I talked to, he said that our activity brought back for him all of the memories of the graffiti he had done. We went back and forth with a bit for this kid about how he could turn what he loved to do into a career, but he didn't really want to hear it. Later, though, I went back to him and I talked to him about Nanaba Chacon and how she used to say that she started out doing this because of the adrenaline rush. But as she got older and she had a child and the risk became too great, she decided to move on from the graffiti. So she turned to the art world. And now her art is being showcased in places like the Navajo Nation Museum. That experience really struck me. It showed me that this path I'm on, the one where I go back to the places I grew up in, talk to the types of kids that I grew up with, and showing them where their paths could lead them. That's the right path for me. Educating our youth is paramount to our continued existence in this country. Corporations rake across land for natural resources, Med Medicaid reforms threaten our tribal sovereignties, breaking treaties left and right. But we also have four new Native candidates running for the Green Party. Diane Humptua became the first Native woman federal judge, and our children are starting movements across the land. Unity councils and Standing Rock rallies have become our war cry. I want to give these kids something to believe in, the opportunity to create their own narratives and show them to the world. Globalism has opened up our chance to share what's happening on the ground through just the click of a button. We can hold our colonizers accountable now and we can tip the scales back into balance. I hope that through my lessons and whatever else comes after, I can teach our kids how to have pride in themselves and their community how to think seven generations ahead. Going forward, I will be joining the American wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art as their 2018-2019 Lifjes Stronach curatorial intern. It is one of the many steps that I plan to take so that I can keep returning to my people and bringing them all that I have learned. Okay, thank you.